Meena Madam, to give her talk on macular hole. Actually, 25 years back, we used to listen to Meena Madam for macular hole surgery when we were doing PG in RIO in 96. So... Nilata. I got into retina seeing her videos. Uh, I was a postgraduate when she was, uh, she was in Arvind. And you know, we used to, I had I was fortunate enough to spend time in her OTs, and that's how I got into Retina, ma'am. In an institute, surgery is different. You are always performing to your podium, but not so in private practice. You are doubly cautious in whatever you do. Thank you, Manoj. My, last, my talk is the last one in this series, and it's a little different in that we are dealing with a different pathology. But basically, what we are doing is the same as what is discussed. It might have become a little boring for you listening to the same way in which how different people peel the internal limiting membrane. I have titled my talk as Responding to Non-Responders of Diabetic Macular Edema, where vitreous surgery is the last choice. Before I begin, we need to know whom a non-responder is. He is a patient whom you have been treating for years, you have injected several times, the pathology that you are dealing with is either persistent or new changes are coming in and you find that his visual equity is dropping. That is a stage when the option for surgical management comes in. And it is very disheartening to note that in a patient who undergoes medical treatment for diabetic macular edema, there is about 25 percentage, 25.9 percentage to be exact, who are non-responders. And in this subgroup of patients, you have to look at other options. You would have gone through the work, starting with one anti-wedge anti agent, switching to a different agent, and the patient has either tolerance or tachyphylaxis, and then using a combination of agents, and when nothing else works, we resort to vitreous surgery. Ideally, from my perspective, that is not the time when you should advise surgery to the patient. Because at that point of time, his macula is so grossly damaged. So even after you have done a wonderful surgery, he is not going to have much visual improvement. But there is an advantage in that his retinopathy would have stabilized with the vitreous surgery. So before you take a decision to operate on your patients, there are very pertinent points that you have to look at. First, whether his diabetic status is controlled, whether it has been worsening over the years. So even if you operate on the patient, you will have persistence of the macular edema in the post-operative period. Secondly, you have to look at the lead retinal perfusion. Is there a macular ischemia? Is there a peripheral retinal ischemia? Peripheral retinal ischemia is okay. You can give laser at the end of the surgery or inject anti-VEGF. But if you have a macular patient with a macular ischemia and if you're going to operate on him, be wise enough to counsel the patient that your procedure may stabilize the process, but his vision will not become normal. You have to take a close look at the vitreoretinal interface and find out whether there is a thickening of the internal limiting membrane. A thick and taut internal limiting membrane is a characteristic feature of a recalcitrant diabetic macular edema. You look at the amount of anteroposterior or tangential traction that is there, whether the PVD is there, whether it is complete, whether it is incomplete, whether there is PVD at the periphery. You have to do a thorough analysis before you take your patient into the theater. So we have gone through this. We have looked at all the things that we look at. And surgery is indicated when there is a macular edema with a vitreo macular pathology. Although there is a definite subgroup of patients with a densely swollen, boggy, diffuse macular edema without macular ischemia where there is no vitreoretinal interface pathology who do respond to vitrectomy and deroofing of the internal limiting membrane. They do respond to that treatment option. So our surgically basically is a co-vitrectomy. You don't have to shave the vitreous base. You detach the posterior hyaloid like all my 
young colleagues did. You peel the external epiretinal membrane, peel the internal limiting membrane, you do laser and you do give anti at the end of the procedure. So you are combining the good options, the good effects of all treatment modalities to give the maximum benefit to your patient. This is a very nice patient of mine. I've been treating him for years. He was 58 years old when he ultimately took a decision to undergo surgery. He is a diabetic. He has all the works. He has renal failure. He has dys dyslipidemia. He has undergone five injections that I have given and several injections elsewhere where he went. When he was dissatisfied with me, he would go elsewhere for treatment. And uh, Sorry. So he has a proliferative diabetic retinopathy and what you see right here could either be a thickened and condensed hyaloid. At the beginning of the procedure I'm peeling off what I think is a thickened condensed hyaloid. There is no vascular proliferation on it. I'm using a knife spatula, a very nice instrument which has a knife on one side and it's blunt on the other. I do most of my dissection with that. You peel off the thick uh, hyaloid and you see that the macula is uh, boggy. There is a lot of hard exudation. He has been treated over the years. Oculoblue is used to stain the hyaloid. And if you look carefully at the previous surgery, the ILM was a little loose. See, you see how thick the internal limiting membrane is. It's a thick and taut internal limiting membrane, which has to be peeled in bits and pieces. It does not come out like a flap that Manoj showed. It will not come out as a single layer because this patient has undergone multiple sittings of laser. The membrane is adherent. Although it is thick, it is very difficult to peel it and you can peel it only in layers. This is his other eye. These are two eyes of the same patient. He has a more extensive pathology in the other eye. Here PVD is induced. And look at this macula. This is not the stage when you should be you should be doing surgery for him. If you want to give him some visual results, you have to counsel him for surgery at an earlier date. I failed in this patient, although I have been seeing him on and off for the last 15 years. You can hardly make out the contrast between the internal limiting membrane and the swollen retina. The membrane comes out almost as a single layer, mostly because his laser may not have been effective because of this retinal swelling. You use a combination of all factors. You use laser, you use anti vegf you leave behind, I leave behind a little bit of TA at the end of the procedure so that the steroid can cause a reduction in the retinal swelling in the postoperative period. And this is his eye down the line. You see how much the exudates have cleared. I have him on follow-up for the last five years at least and he has been, he has no significant visual improvement, nothing that he can boast of, but his macula is fine. There are definite advantages of, p of doing a vitrectomy in diabetic macular edema. You are deroofing the thickened internal limiting membrane. You are removing the inflammatory sump, which is the vitreous cavity. The half-life of the VEGF that is produced in the eye becomes reduced. And whatever drug you, that you are injecting at the end of the surgery diffuses into the macula. So you have definite advantages of performing past planar vitrectomy in your patient. In addition to that, you are removing ascorbate, which is the main eater of oxygen in the retina. So, so the oxygen does not reach the retina. The, re, the oxygen is taken up by the ascorbate and antioxidant in the vitreous cavity. Once you remove that, there is better oxygenation of the tissues. So PPB for diabetic macular edema is indicated in the presence of an obvious anteroposterior hyaloidal traction, tangential traction, and it is also indicated in non-tractional diffuse diabetic macular edema. You have to evaluate your OCTs preoperatively. You should have a one-in-one -one understanding with your patient, discuss how it is going to be in the postoperative period, explain to him that his macular edema will take time to come down, and 
most of the time the number of injections that you require after that is much much less than the number of injection you would have had to take had he not undergone the surgery the results with the resolution of the macular edema is very good visual recovery may not be that good from my personal point of view i have been operating on diabetic macular edema from probably 1996 onwards the results have been extremely satisfactory both for the surgeon as well as for the patient so there is something which needs to be covered when you are dealing with peeling of the internal limiting membrane this is not related to diabetic macular edema these are the results of patients with the macular epiretinal membrane if you follow up your patient and do an rnfl analysis in this patient you see that there is a definite thinning of the temporal macula in the first first one month of the post operative period there is when sanofel occurs or a swelling of the arcuate retinal layer occurs the macula is thickened and then you find that there is gradually the retinal nerve fiber layer thins down this thinning of the nerve fiber layer fortunately does not give rise to a scotoma or a visual field defect and it correlates has a definite correlation with the amount of retinal tissue that is stuck to the under surface of the internal limiting membrane that you peel there is a definite dysfunction in the macula induced by the peeling it produces erg changes but luckily for us it does not translate into a visual loss in this patient however when you are talking to the patient all this should be put across to him this is the donafel or the dissociated optic nerve fiber layer that you see in patients who undergo post operatively if you see what the post op slides that biju arsha the manoj showed that there is a sort of appearance of the surface of the retina it is because at those points the muller cell is damaged and the retina is collapsed in that area the surface of the retina becomes irregular so you are you are taking away the retinal scaffold in that area and definitely it produces some physical deformity on the retinal surface and luckily it does not translate into a visual loss so ilm peeling is a good procedure it is safe so you should not go back home thinking that macular surgery is very easy we do sometimes deal with very very difficult cases i thought i would show you three of the stinkers that i have dealt with in my practice this is a man from central kerala who came to me with a uh, um, submacular hemorrhage i did a vitrectomy and subretinal injection of air along with anti vegf he did very well his edema clear and if you look at the second slide you can see at the bottom there is an yellow air yellow color which is the subretinal blood which has been pushed away from the center and then he developed a macular hole he underwent surgery for that with a different technique from what is described by manoj i do not use gas tamponade i have not used it since 2007 i use autologous blood the patient's blood drawn at the time of surgery to create a sticky base at the macula the macula hole and then i stuff with a three layer stuffing first layer will be the autologous blood second layer will be the internal limiting membrane and the third layer will again be autologous blood this has given me very good results this is a technique i use in large macular holes more than 1000 micron size so it's a huge macular hole you can see the stuffed uh, tissue he did quite well and on follow up he had recurrence of the whatever pathology the choroidal neovascular membrane which is responsible for the subretinal blood 6 months down the rain and he is now getting injections for the same this is another stinker a patient who underwent an uneventful phaco vitrectomy for um, epiretinal membrane and this is what is there on the first post operative day she has a central retinal artery occlusion so here you are do you are doing your surgery there is no efflux of fluid from the eye you are using valve cannulas whatever goes in goes in you are injecting material into the eye you are using ta into the eye for some time there is an overload of fluid into the eye you are injecting a dye into the eye and all this can hamper the perfusion and result in this situation so if you have a patient who at any point of time had a raised intraoperative intraocular pressure in those patients on your active port it would be a good idea to take out your sleeve take out the valve and have that port open during surgery so that this does not occur last week i operated on a fellow i this i did well fortunately it was a partial uh, incomplete uh, occlusion she 
went away and came back again for surgery in the other eye. In the second eye, I did that. I took away, took out the valve so that there is an egress of fluid from my active port. And this is the third stinker, a classmate of mine who brought his mother for surgery, had a huge vitreomacular traction, and we did a combined phaco vitrectomy, and after the phaco was over and I went in, this is what I saw. It had de spontaneously and produced a ma large macular hole. So your surgical technique becomes a little difficult. So the take-home message is that you have to speak to your patient, show them all the images, speak to them, tell them what to expect in the post-operative period. And I thank you very much for being here on the last day of the meeting. And thanks for your patient hearing. Do you have any questions uh, for discussion, anybody, or any topic to be? Uh, yeah, Ash. Uh, regarding the combined phaco vitrectomy, how do you uh, uh, plan your post-operative medications to reduce the inflammation? What all medicines you will have? First and foremost, I told you I leave behind a little triamcinolone yesterday in the vitreous cavity. It ensures that I have a very quiet eye in the post-operative period, and I have not seen a single patient whose pressure has gone up. Very Secondly, I use uh, cyclopendulate to keep the pupil dilated. I use cyclopendulate so that the pupil is a little mobile, a single application at night. So this ensures that there is no problem. We have been doing, I have been doing phaco vitrectomy since 2000. We also do combined surgery. The cataract surgeon, Dr. Sai, will come and do the, this thing. And one or two cases we had Iris Bombay and uh, IOP variations and all. Probably we have missed an occludable angle or something which has yeah. become uh, that we have missed probably. If your gas ambulant, the gas lens side yeah, diaphragm, diaphragm is pushed, would have been pushed forward. Maybe that is cause. Otherwise, uh, it is quite a. But like our Ashad said, there is a definite myopic shift in your post-operative uh, refraction, about 0 0.5 diopters. What you can do is that if you are, do, when you are doing your pre-operative biometry, if you are using an uh, A-scan biometer, you take your axial length you, and add to it the central retinal thickness that you get from OCT. It will ensure that you get a, a, a true axial length. If you are using an optical biometer, that does not, it does not matter because you are measuring up to the retinal pigment epithelia. So it ensures that there is, there is no post-operative surprise. In fact, and, and nowadays, um, uh, in most of the macular surgeries, you know, we would tend to prefer an earlier cataract surgery. So many of these guys have gas, and then they end up with a cataract subsequently in the fakey eyes. So therefore, you know, it makes a little uh, sense to actually operate on the cataracts earlier. And we also do a combined uh, procedure I mean, where we do the cataract and, and vitectomy in the same setting. Unless the patient wants a stage surgery for all posterior segment procedures which require cataract, a combined procedure would be ideal. We put a suture, a single suture, the, the um, phaco incision alone is sutured with a single suture which we remove at the second postoperative visit. Or at the end of the surgery also if there is no leak we can. We can, we can do that. We leave it for a week. Mm. We tried out initially by putting the ports, the infusion port at the beginning of the procedure followed by FACO. We found out that it inevitably causes a very much deepening of the posterior sure. chamber. And uh, when you are going back in, you may, you, with your active port, you may damage the posterior capsule. Regarding, Madam, regarding, uh, you said about uh, stuffing of the ILM in the macular hole. And uh, what, what is the specific instrument that you use for this, whether you use the vitrectal probe itself or the, is the, the silicone tape cannula? Is there any uh, risk of enlarging the hole during the procedure? I, I use a spatula, a blunt spatula, steel spatula. Indo-German has a thin, twen I, most of my surgeries are 23 gauge. I use a 23 gauge blunt spatula, it is blunt. And I, I use a finesse flex loop to initiate the ILM peeling. I do a double re macular rexis. The first rexis is a small rexis because I do not want too much tissue to stuff in. Sometimes you have a, the hole may not accommodate all the ILM. So my first rexis is to stuff. And the second one is to relax but the... When you're when you stuffing, you are using the same spatula itself? Yes. Okay. 
it, it is seen that if you traumatize the edges of the hole, when I learned, first learned macular hole surgery, we were thought to traumatize the edge of the hole because it released tissue factors and caused the hole to close. Those days we did only a co-vitrectomy, there was no staining, we did not use TA. So we also did not know whether our vitrectomy was complete or not. So those days we were thought to just use a blunt spatula and scrape on the edges of the hole. But if you have seen that after ILM peeling, you take a blunt spatula and uh, scrape on the, not on the edges of the hole, along the sides of the hole, you can see that the hole closes in the form of a horizontal slit which is an interoperative sign that uh, your surgery is going to work. So at the end of the procedure, I take a spatula and s try to push the hole inside, mm -hmm. to close the hole mechanically. And you can s always see that the hole becomes a small slit. Because sometimes it happens that after the stuffing, it, 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 it seems that sometimes the hole is seeming a little more larger than initially. You know? Once you stuff it... Uh, it, it because of the tissue is there, it will be protruding out a, a little bit. I, I think, Abhijit sir, um, uh, the instrument uh, that, you, you, that you use now depends on uh, what you are uh, used to. Madam, is, uh, you know, she is quite um, used to the, uh, you know, to the thing. So, I try to use the forceps itself, you know. You, you can, can use to, an ILM forceps. You can use the ILM forceps itself to stuff. So, the, or, or the cutter, sometimes I use the cutter. So, the, I don't think the instrument uh, matters, but the uh, uh, thing is that stuffing should be a very gentle process and as the newer techniques have evolved, it appears like you don't need to stuff it. You can just, you know, uh, just bunch them up at the fo fovea, at the around the uh, hole, and do a fluid Even direction. Even that noise. may not be necessary. If you have a large ILM flap, you just invert it over the hole. If you are doing a fluid air exchange, it stays there. I don't do a fluid air exchange, so I have to stuff it in for my flap to remain over the hole. I think uh, each surgeon has uh, some preferences, some methods which works with that surgeon. So we don't want to confuse everyone uh, which is the ideal method. So there will be some difference, but uh, I think uh, reasonab reasonably a standard macular hole surgery 90% will close. Even recently I see some patients told, I mean some doctor has told is it useless not to do any surgery for macular hole. It is not like that. Most of the holes large holes also 90% closes by one of these procedures and visual recovery is also not bad. If you don't operate a macular hole, ultimately it will be county finger 2 meter, right? So if you operate, it may become 624, 618, 6, large macular hole and become, sometimes it uh, gains 69. So that is the message that I thought. The type 2 hole closure may be there in some of the patients, especially if you are dealing with very large holes. That is also a type of closure. Although the hole is there, there is no subretinal fluid and the patient's vision definitely does improve. So once again, thank you very much for uh, being here with us today. Hope we have given you a take-home message. Thank you.